Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hello, my name is Johnson, and I'm an alcoholic, and we want to welcome you to the uh, Johnny and Fly uh, Big Book Study Podcast of Alcoholics Anonymous. We're just sober alcoholics studying the big book together. Let's start with a moment of silence, followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. In 1973, Joe McHugh introduced Charlie P. as an AA speaker at an Al-Anon convention. Joe and Charlie soon discovered that they shared a love for the big book of alcohol tsunami. Traveling between their homes and discussing the big book became a regular event. Okay. Jonathan and, and, and Clyde met in the Zoo Group, the original Zoo Group AA meeting, and discovered that we also loved studying the big book together. And so we would ask if we would start a podcast. And so we meet here every Sunday from 2 p.m. until 3.30 p.m. in this room. We ask that you please have your big book handy and read along with us. Take notes also and underline and highlight what we read. We actually encourage you to read ahead of us so that as, as we progress and read the book, we'll be looking for participants to come in and tell us what you've learned over the course of these weeks. We'll be recording these on audio onto our own podcast. And you can go and um, listen to the podcast on YouTube or just go to our website at thezuku.org. So the purpose of this big book study meeting is to help you. When you're meeting with a prospect, now we call them sponsees, or just talking about someone, talking to someone in general about AA, we want you to be armed with the fact about yourself in the AA program. Because freedom from alcohol comes from taking the 12 steps and working with others. Now, this is what the 12 steps are. It tells us on page 15 of the 12 and 12. AA 12 steps are group of principles, spiritual in nature, with if practice as a way of life can expel the obsession to drink and enable a sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. So how soon do you want to be happy, joyous, and free? We suggest that you purchase a copy of the big book for future use. You might want to underline and highlight and take notes as we study this together. Purchase your AA literature directly from AA so that the money goes to steps. But we highly suggest that you have a sense of urgency in taking the 12 steps and having them become a way of life sooner than later. Act as if this was a matter of life and death, because it actually is a matter of life and simply. You can go to our website at the zoomfood.org and order a copy of the big book as well as read it online. Now, the big book is our basic text and it contains four recipes for recovery. It's impossible to find a loophole in the big book that excludes you from being a member of AA. All right, thank you all so much for coming out. At this time, we're going to recap what we previously read. We just started the book and Clive's going to come in and give us the uh, recap. And then we're going to begin reading today at the forward to the third edition. That is page 22 in Roman numerals. That's XXII. So come on in, Clyde. Okay, thank you, Cousin Jonathan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Clyde. Glad to be here and uh, studying the big book together. So uh, we're going to, I just want to do a quick recap of what we just started last week. And I just want to give you kind of the highlights of what we read last week. We read the preface, the forward to the first edition, and the forward to the second edition. By the way, we encourage you to have your big book in front of you and uh, with a pen and a highlighter and so you can make notes and underline things and write in the margins and, you know, really get the full experience here of, of learning uh, from this, this book. So uh, in the preface, that was the first thing we read. I just want to point out a couple of things. First of all, um, they mentioned that there's been a, a strong sentiment against any radical changes being made to the first 164 pages. 
and then it's been left largely untouched in the course of revisions. This book was published 85 years ago in April of 1939, and they have made essentially no changes to the first 164 pages and to Dr. Silkworth's uh, doctor's opinion. And, and that's because it's so effective and it works so well, they don't want to change it. So we learned that. And then one change they did make in the second edition was they really expanded the personal stories in the back uh, of the book. There's 42 stories in the back of the book and they changed those to, to better, more accurately reflect our, our fellowship and, and the people in the group. And, and they ended, uh, the, we ended the preface with they suggest that you really read those stories in the back of the book. And John mentioned last week, a lot of people start there before they even read the book. They start at the back because you can really identify with the other recovered alcoholics and, and say, yes, they said, yes, that happened to me, or yes, I felt like that, or most important, yes, I believe this program can work for me too. So that was the preface. Then in the forward to the first edition, we learn what the book is about. It says to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. That's on page XIII, forward to the first edition. That's the main purpose of the book, to show us precisely how to recover from alcoholism, okay? And then uh, the other thing is on, the, on page XIV, the only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. If you look in the back of the book at the 12 traditions, they did not carry over the word honest. Our third tradition is just the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. So they didn't put it in the traditions, but it is here, honest desire to stop drinking. So that's that. And then in the forward to the second edition, uh, we learned that Bill had been relieved of his drink obsession by a sudden spiritual experience following a meeting with Ebby, who used the Oxford group principles to get sober. So I'm gonna do a screen share here and show you Ebby Thatcher. Here he is. And uh, so I hope, hopefully you guys can see that okay. That's Ebby and then here's a picture of when he's a little older that's Bill Wilson with Abby, okay? So that's who we're talking about. Abby got sober using the Oxford Group uh, steps and, and program, uh, spiritual program. And then he's the one that uh, met with Bill and they were friends, good friends, drinking buddies. And Bill decided that, well, gee, if this worked for him, maybe it'll work for me. So that's kind of how our, our fellowship got it start with those guys um so here let me uh what else did i want to say if anything about the second edition oh yeah dr silkworth he's credited with uh describing to bill you know the grave nature of alcoholism and uh so and also we learned that only an alcohol alcoholic can help another alcoholic that was another key thing in there so uh, let's go ahead. Uh, that's enough of a recap, I think. And, and we'll just continue now with the forward to the third edition. Okay. And that's on page XXII. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and read for us um, in, until Cousin Jonathan tells me to stop reading. It says, by March 1976, when this edition went to the printer, the total worldwide membership of Alcoholics Anonymous was conservatively estimated at more than 1 million, with almost 28,000 groups meeting in over 90 countries. Surveys of groups in the United States and Canada indicate that AA is reaching out not only to more and more people, but to a wider and wider range. Women now make up more than one fourth of the membership. Among newer members, the proportion is nearly one third. 
7% of the AAs surveyed are less than 30 years of age, among them many in their teens. The basic principles of the AA program, it appears, hold good for individuals with many different lifestyles, just as the program has brought recovery to those of many different nationalities. The 12 steps that summarize the program may be called Los Doce Pasos in one country, Le Du Eta in another, but they trace exactly the same path to recovery that was blazed by the earliest members of Alcoholics Anonymous. In spite of the great increase in the size and the span of this fellowship, at its core, it remains simple and personal. Each day, somewhere in the world, recovery begins when one alcoholic talks <clears throat> with another alcoholic, sharing experience, strength, and hope. Oh, great. <clears throat> now that is forward to the third edition. A lot of information there. And it emphasizes again that each day somewhere in the world, recovery begins while wow. when one alcoholic simply talks with another alcoholic, sharing their experience, strength, and hope. And I think that that's one of the key points that we talk about in our home group, where we say that uh, you can start practicing steps 10, 11, and 12. You're very early in AA. And uh, um, the, book, the book says that. You know, um, you can uh, come into AA, start attending meetings, and uh, you can get sober and start attending meetings and be on your way home and see see someone who's still drinking and they ask you, uh, how are you doing? And, and you simply let them know that I'm not drinking anymore. I'm attending meetings in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a sponsor and I've joined the home group. And uh, that could be a message right there for someone else to, um, to start to ponder um, getting sober. It can be that simple, you know? All right, we're going to continue to read. Yeah, but I just want to... Um, forward to the fourth edition. Go ahead, Clyde. Yeah, uh, before we move on, I just want to talk about a little bit more about what Cousin just said about the one alcoholic talking with another. Back in the forward to the second edition, it said, uh, when it was talking about um, Dr. Bob getting sober, said uh, with you know Bill Wilson helping them go through the process, it said, this seemed to prove, I'm at the bottom of page XVI, this seemed to prove that one alcoholic could affect another as no non-alcoholic could. It also indicated that strenuous work, one alcoholic with another, was vital to permanent recovery. So that's how we recovered, just like it says, one alcoholic talking with another, sharing experience, strength, and hope. That is the, the most important concept of Alcoholics Anonymous, service, working with other alcoholics. So just remember that. So, okay, then um, we'll go ahead and read the forward to the fourth edition. And that's on page XXIII, page Roman numeral 23. This fourth edition of Alcoholics Anonymous came off press in November 2001 at the start of a new millennium. Since the third edition was published in 1976, worldwide membership of AA has just about doubled to an estimated 2 million or more with nearly 100,800 groups meeting in approximately 150 countries around the world. Literature has played a major role in AA's growth and a striking phenomenon of the past quarter century has been the explosion of translations of our basic literature into many languages and dialects. In country after country where the AA seed was planted, it has taken root slowly at first, then growing by leaps and bounds when literature has become available. Currently, Alcoholics Anonymous has been translated into 43 languages. That's our book. You can stop right there, Clyde. Yes. Clyde, let's get a word check. Let's get a word check, phenomenon. Can do. 
That's one of those big words. I think it means something that happens every once in a while. It's almost like a mirror. But uh, look it up. Let's get right to it. Whoops. There we go. Let's see. It says uh, something that is observed to happen or exist. Hold on. Let's get a better definition than that. I'm going to stop the screen share and just go. So phenomenon. OK, it says. Yeah, it's something. yeah go ahead, cousin. No, I couldn't hear you. Go ahead. Okay. That word. Uh, yeah, it, it's uh, something that can be observed and studied, and that is typically unusual. So it's it's something that that happens. It it doesn't happen very often, and and it's and it's uh, unusual or difficult to explain fully. That's what it says. Yeah, that's what I kind of thought. It it uh, uh, happens rarely, and it's almost like a miracle. Okay, so that says that the. Uh, Literature has played a major role in AA's growth and a striking phenomenon of the past quarter century. This book works miracles, it says. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's continue to read. No, okay. we've been across these words. If we're not sure what they are, we're going to stop and we're going to find out. You know, we're going to stop and we're going to find out. That's part of studying the book. Yeah. Good. All right. That's what we do. That's how we do it. So, okay, we'll keep reading here. As the message of recovery has reached larger numbers of people, it has also touched the lives of a vastly greater variety of suffering alcoholics. When the phrase, we are people who normally would not mix, page 17 of this book, was written in 1939, it referred to a fellowship composed largely of men and a few women with quite similar social, ethnic, and economic backgrounds. Like so much of AA's basic text, those words have proved to be far more visionary than the founding members could have ever imagined. The stories added to this edition represent a membership whose characteristics of age, gender, race, and culture have widened and have deepened to encompass virtually everyone the first 100 members could have hoped to reach. While our literature has preserved the integrity of the AA message, sweeping changes in society as a whole are reflected in new customs and practices within the fellowship. Taking advantage of technological advances, for example, AA members with computers can participate in meetings online sharing with fellow alcoholics across the country or around the world. Sound familiar? In any meeting, anywhere, AAs share experience, strength, and hope with each other in order to stay sober and help other alcoholics. Modem to modem or face to face, AAs speak the language of the heart in all its power and simplicity. Wow, thank you so much. Could you could you uh, just pause for a minute? I just want to co-host Carrie and Mo, please. Okay, co-host Carrie. We're going to co-host and Mo. And Mo. Carrie, you got your hand up. What's up? Oh, I just, I, I, I had looked up that word myself and I just, in layman's terms, it just says a rare or significant fact or event okay. and that is the word phenomenon right yeah so now everybody knows what that means it's going to come up in the book a few more times by the way so so now we all know what it means the rare occurrence that happens every once in a while you know like us getting sober <laughs> uh -huh. that's a phenomenon <laughs> okay all right, so from here, <clears throat> we're going to get into the doctor's opinion, one of the most talked about letters in AA. 
and it was written by Dr. William Duncan Silkworth. And uh, in case you don't know who he is, I'm going to read the weather. Matter of fact, Kerry, pull him up. And uh, why don't you read the Wethopedia on him? Tell us who he is. While Clyde gets some pictures of him up. Pictures yeah. of him, where he worked at, and pictures of him with Bill W. and all of that. Read the two it may concern. No, I want you to um, Google who Dr. Silkworth was and read who he was. Straight out of the uh, Google. So we're not making anything up. But there's so many stories about Definition him. of Dr. Silkworth for AA. Yeah. Go ahead, give us his Wikipedia. Let's say, when was he born? What did he do? When did he die? Where did he live? Let's get all of that good stuff out there before we start. Okay. William Duncan Silkworth, July 22nd, 1873 to March 22nd, 1951, was an American physician and specialist in the treatment of alcoholism. He was the director of the Charles B. Towns. Hospital for Drug and Alcohol Addictions in New York City in the 1930s, during which time William Griffith Wilson, a future co-founder of AA, was admitted on four occasions for alcoholism. Dr. Silkworth was a profound influence on Wilson and encouraged him to realize that alcoholism was more than just an issue of moral weakness. He was introduced, he introduced Wilson to the idea that alcoholism had a pathological di disease-like basis. Okay, that's what we got? Yeah. All right, thank you. And I'm glad that it that it that it brought up that he was one of the co-founders. A lot of time we go into AA meetings and we see Bill's picture. And we see Dr. Block's picture, and it says co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. There are many co-founders, you know? Like it says, Dr. Um Silkworth was a co-founder. Uh, Clarence Snyder was one of the co-founders. Um, <clears throat> Mark, um, um, Park, um, Hank Parkhurst was one of the co-founders. There's probably a whole list. If we Google co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, it, it may be about 20 or 25 people altogether. But it's the two main ones that, that we often talk about and um and that we know. Now, check this out. If they're the co-founders, who's the founder? <laughs> oh. Well, this is a God-given program. Who is so the, God is the founder. founder of Alcoholics Anonymous? <laughs> Let me start right there. If if they're all co-founders, who's the founder? Yeah. God. I, I, I said, it's God. Quote yeah. <laughs> yes, no doubt. Oh, so great. So we know about uh, a little bit about Dr. Silkworth. We got some pictures of him, which I had just ran into. Uh, I've been coming in, in and out of AA for 30 years. I never saw a picture of Dr. Silkworth uh, until about three years ago. I never bothered to look what this guy looks like. Saw pictures of Dr. Bob and, and Bill W., and that was it. I started to find and seek out pictures of um, um, Abby Thatcher, Roland Hazard, Dr. Silkworth, uh, Man on the Bed, Bill D, and all of these people. How many of us have never seen any pictures of these people but been reading about them in these books for years, right? Isn't that something? You know? It says That's that Bill anyway. Wilson and Dr. Bob are considered the original co-founders of AA. Right, they're the original co-founders. Yeah, we get that. But there's many people who added and they become co-founders too. Yeah, like we find in all of them. Great. All right, thank you. All right, class gonna start reading. Now this doctor's opinion is where we find out about alcoholism and we find out about the uh the solution too. So uh let's go. Okay. Yeah, here we go. So this is on page XXV, Roman numeral twenty-five, the doctor's opinion. And so this first paragraph is Bill writing to us. And what he says is, we of Alcoholics Anonymous, that means the fellowship, believe that the reader, that's the alcoholic reading the book, will be interested in the medical estimate 
of the plan of recovery described in this book. Convincing testimony must surely come from medical men who have had experience with the sufferings of our members and have witnessed our return to health. A well-known doctor, chief physician at a nationally prominent hospital specializing in alcoholic and drug addiction, gave Alcoholics Anonymous this letter. So let's just stop right here briefly and mention. So this book has a plan of recovery, co plan of recovery described in it. And there's convincing testimony must come from medical, a doctor, okay? Because our, our problem as alcoholics is not only physical, it's mental and spiritual too. It's all three. So we're going to get the medical, physical part of it explained now. This well-known doctor, Dr. Silkworth. And this nationally prominent hospital is the Charles B. Towns Hospital. I'll show you a picture of that in a little bit in New York. Okay. So here's the uh, letter that Dr. Silkworth gave the bill and the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's pretty brief, this initial letter. It says, to whom it may concern, I have specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. In late 1934, I attended a patient, that's Bill Wilson, who though he had been a competent businessman of good earning capacity, was an alcoholic of a type I had come to regard as hopeless. In the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This has become the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 others appear to have recovered. There it is again, this sharing, working with other alcoholics. Very important, of course. It says, I personally know scores of cases who were of the type with whom other methods had failed completely. These facts appear to be of extreme medical importance because of the extraordinary possibilities of rapid growth inherent in this group. They may mark a new epoch in the annals of alcoholism. These men may well have a remedy for thousands of such situations. You may rely absolutely on anything they say about themselves, very truly yours, William D. Silkworth, M.D. So it's pretty short and sweet what he's telling us. And the key point is must do likewise in impressing upon them that uh, to, you have to present your conceptions to others, to still others. That's what their program, our whole program of recovery is based on working with other alcoholics, sharing the message, carrying the message. So should we keep reading, cousin? I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, that's just short and sweet. And he says, hey, these guys have a system that works. They share it with each other and, and it's, it's working. You can believe anything they say about alcoholism. These guys are the real deal. So that, that's all that first little letter says that he wrote. So now this is good news for us and in the fellowship originally, the physician who at our request gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. So we're gonna get some more detail now about alcoholism, this is great. In this statement, he confirms what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe, there's that must again, that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. This was groundbreaking information back then. 
because everybody had all these years prior to this thought that it was just a mental moral thing with us. And this is talking about how our body is abnormal too. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, that we were in full flight from reality or were outright mental defectives. That's all mental stuff. These things were true to some extent. In fact, to a considerable extent with some of us, but we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. So this is part of the reason that Bill was able to get sober, because Dr. Selkworth explained this to him. We're going to read all about it. So this is Bill still filling us in with this new information. The doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. And an allergy is an unusual reaction that most people don't have. As laymen, our opinion as to its soundness may, of course, mean little. But as ex-problem drinkers, that means recovered alcoholics, we can say that his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. Though we work out our solution on the spiritual as well as an altruistic plane, we favor hospitalization for the alcoholic who is very jittery or befogged. So if you're, you have to be careful about, some people do need to be medically detoxed. They can't just jump right into the 12th to doing the program and having the spiritual awakening. It says more often than not, it is imperative that a man's brain be cleared before he is approached as he then has a better chance of understanding and accepting what we have to offer. Okay, so we're going to get into the letter now. Does anybody want to comment on what we just read, what Bill wrote and explained about our bodies having an allergy to alcohol? Dr. Silkworth is going to tell us all about it in its letter that we're about to read. Let's do a word check. Altruistic. Altruistic. Yeah. Yes. I believe that that means one person working with another, that this can't be done alone. But pull it out. <clears throat> yeah. We don't work alone. Okay. Altruistic. So we work on a solution on a spiritual as well as an altruistic point. Go ahead. Nope. Altruistic. Helping others, showing concern for the welfare of others. So mm -hmm. it's helping each yeah. other. That's right. One alcoholic working with another again. Big part That's of the program. Right. Yes. Very important. It, it keeps getting repeated over and over. There must be a reason mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are you guys ready to read what the Dr. Silkworth tells us about alcoholism. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and continue now. Here's what the doctor writes at the top of page XXVII. It's Roman numeral page 27. The subject presented in this book seems to me to be of paramount importance to those afflicted with alcoholic addiction. I say this after many years experience as medical director of one of the oldest hospitals in the country treating alcoholic and drug addiction. That's Towns Hospital. I'll show you guys a picture in a little bit. There was therefore a sense of real satisfaction when I was asked to contribute a few words on a subject which is covered in such masterly detail in these pages. So <clears throat> he's, um, he's looking at this as a privilege and an honor to be able to contribute to this book here. It says, we doctors have realized for a long time that some form of moral psychology was of urgent importance to alcoholics, but its application presented difficulties beyond our conception. What with our ultra-modern standards, our scientific approach to everything, 
we are perhaps not well equipped to apply the powers of good that lie outside our synthetic knowledge. So uh, from a psychiatric standpoint, the, 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 the moral psychology, uh, the, there's not, not enough there for us to recover from alcoholism. That's what he's saying. Many years ago, one of the leading contributors to this book came under our care in this hospital. He's talking about Bill Wilson. And while here, he acquired some ideas which he put into practical application at once. Later, he requested the privilege of being allowed to tell his story to other patients here. And with some misgiving, we consented the cases we have followed through have been most interesting. In fact, many of them are amazing. The unselfishness of these men, there's that word again, altruistic, as we have come to know them, the entire absence of profit motive and their community spirit, that's the fellowship, that's us, the group, is indeed inspiring to one who has labored long and wearily in this alcoholic field. They believe in themselves, so they've experienced the promises. And still more in the power, with a capital P, which pulls chronic alcoholics back from the gates of death. So here we're learning the keys to recovery here very early on in the big book. We need a power, a higher power, and we need to work with each other, be altruistic and unselfish. And community spirit, the group, okay? The, the fellowship. So we need fellowship, altruism, and a higher power. So we're learning about this at this real early stage in the book. Beautiful. Of course, an alcoholic ought to be freed from his physical craving for liquor. And this often requires a definite hospital procedure before psychological measures can be of maximum benefit. Again, some people need medical detox. So we'll keep reading here. It says, we believe, and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. Aha, uh -huh. these allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. So now that's the first time I've heard that word. And with the first time I read this, it hit me like a ton of bricks, the phenomenon of craving. Boy, does that make sense to me. Once I start drinking, I have got to have more. That is the phenomenon of craving. That's my physical allergy manifesting itself. And I'm assuming you experience the same thing. So go ahead and keep reading here. Frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. The message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their lives. So here we're getting some more insight. Let's stop right there, Paul. Let's stop right there. Yes. Again, let's stop right there. I think that you've read a lot. And it talks about the phenomenon of craving. Now we've looked up the word phenomenon. We know that uh, that doesn't that means that that doesn't happen to everyone. It does not happen to everyone, first off. <clears throat> then it goes down to let us know that for, what is frothy emotional ap appeal? Frothy emotional appeal. Yeah, well, frothy means soft, insubstantial. <laughs> yeah, insubstantial. Crocodile tears. Crocodile tears won't do it. Right. Foxhole prayers won't do it. It's already talking about how sincerity is going to have to be a part of my makeup. 
if I'm going to get sober. Mm -hmm. The message that can interest and in, in hold an alcoholic must have depth and weight. It must be real. In all, in nearly all cases, their um, ideals, our ideals, must be grounded in a power greater than ourselves if we are to recreate our lives. I can't be bullshitting, man. I'm not going to get sober bullshit. Let's get some questions and comments from our um, our friends here. Anyone want a question or comment on what we're reading here today so far? Let's raise your hand. Where is Towns Hospital? Towns Hospital is in New York City on the Upper East Side, Upper 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 West Side, Upper West Side. Uh, you look right off of there into um into Central Park. I think it's one around. Matter of fact, it's a few blocks away from where um. Paul McCartney killed that. I mean, yeah. John Lennon. John Lennon, right on that same street. Central Park um, West. Yeah, there's a picture of and it. Now, back it's, in now the day. it's a big condo. Now it's, now it's a big uh, big condo co-op. It costs a million dollars, a couple of million dollars for a room in there now. It's a big co-op condo now. Yeah. yeah. What was that? What? Yeah, that's where it's at. I walked past there uh, many times and didn't even know what it was. It's just a big, big apartment building, big, ritzy apartment building. Mm -hmm. Until I looked it up and said, oh, that was the old town's hospital. So that's where it's at. It's in New York, in the Upper West Side. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments about the phenomenon of craving? Okay. Keep going. All right. Yeah. And, and so it's talking about this uh, we need a higher power to recreate our lives. That's to have a spiritual awakening and be changed, recreate. So, okay. It says if any feel, that as psychiatrists directing a hospital for alcoholics, we appear somewhat sentimental. Let them stand with us a while on the firing line. See the tragedies, the despairing wives, the little children. Let the solving of these problems become a part of their daily work and even of their sleeping moments. And the most cynical will not wonder that we have accepted and encouraged this movement. We feel after many years of experience that we have found nothing which has contributed more to the rehabilitation of these men than the altruistic movement now growing up among them. There's that word again, altruistic. You know what? When, 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 I, when I read this, they talk about hospitalization. What does the word being... altruistic mean? Go ahead, one go person ahead. helping another one person helping another yeah not doing this not doing not doing this without helping someone else altruistic together one person helping another and yep. when, when you know what this made me think about when you just read this a psychiatrist uh, uh directing a hospital for alcoholics we may feel somewhat sentimental then it goes on to say uh let them stand on the fire and night and see the tragedy I think if there's more people admitted for alcoholism than there are fucking gunshot wounds in America each day. Mm -hmm. Wow. Ain't that something? And both are dead. A gunshot wound and alcoholism. You know, you get shot, you recover, right? They sew you up, you know, if you recover. They sew you up, you heal up, and um, you can you can go on a little normal life as, as, as long as you don't get shot again. But with alcoholism, we take a drink, we get really, really sick. We go into the hospital, they help us out, they sober us up. Matter of fact, check this out. When somebody gets shot, right, and when someone's in the hospital for alcoholism, there's actually more people attending to the person with alcoholism than they are the gunshot wound person. Gunshot wound person has a doctor and he has a nurse who um, fix them up and discharge them. 
alcoholic goes into the hospital. He gets a doctor. He gets a nurse. He gets a counselor. He gets AA coming in to see him. He's got family coming to visit him. Wow, how serious is this disease? You look over and the guy next to you suffering from alcoholism. He's got eight people standing around him. And here I am. I got shot. And there's only two people concerned with me. Show you the seriousness of this thing. Check that out. Yeah, this is this is a very serious. It's deadly. Yeah. So again, we're we're learning how important it is to carry the message and work with other alcoholics. Altruistic movement. That's what we're all about. So okay, I'll go ahead and read the next paragraph at the bottom of the page. And this really makes so much sense to me. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. That's this why is, I drink. Yeah, me That's too. Why I drink. At yep. first it was fun. And there were other reasons. But in the end, I drank to get high. You often hear me say that. Yeah. We're going to have Loretta Mama Bear has her hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, come on in, Loretta. Loretta Mama Bear, and I'm definitely an alcoholic. Um, I have on the bottom of my page here, it says, mind, body, and spirit must be aligned with each other. Um, I, I know I drank alcohol because I just felt like there's some that, yeah I didn't have control over the universe I would just say father God it's yours have another drink and, and uh I did you know I was a, I was a lone drinker I, for 30 years I, I drank alone I, I didn't like drinking with other alcoholics because they got on my nerves and and I was afraid I would do something stupid but um but coming into AA and learning the allergy that it was, because I got to the point where I said, I said, why do I have to drink? You know, why can't I stop? And and now I know why, it's because it's an allergy. And then in this recovery thing, I've learned, that I'm learning that mind, body, and spirit must be aligned with each other. So it's important for me to be, to participate in these meetings yeah sometimes i don't it was, but that's rare rare i usually have something to say even if it's say hi so um that's all that i have to say for now peace out okay anyone else i like to take this paragraph class because i'm real familiar with this one because it just talks so much about me why did i drink this is something that I often go over with people when I'm sitting down with them, you know, because this was something that I didn't know. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they can't, they, they admit that it's injurious. Yeah, I know that it's killing me, but I cannot after a time differentiate the two from the false. To them, the alcoholic life seemed the only normal. I was restless, irritable, and discontent unless I could experience that sense of ease and comfort that came at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks which, yeah, I saw others taking with impunity. After I had succumbed to the desire again, as so many of us do, the phenomenon of craving developed, and I passed through a well-known spree of straight state st stage of sprees, and I always emerged remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This was repeated over and over again, and unless I could experience an entire psychic change, there was very little chance for my recovery. That's how I read that, man. you know, because, you know, that was me. That was me looking for that sense of ease and comfort, the easy way out. And I thought that that was the only way. 
You know, I all was going to save me from everything. And the bottom line is, it got me hot, you know? And I like that feeling. Anybody else can identify with that. This might be a dumb question, but mind, body, spirit must align for what? I didn't, I didn't hear you, Terry. That, that was uh, Mama Bear that said that. that. That was not in the book. Mind, body, and spirit must be aligned with each other, with, each, with all of us. In order for what? In order, in order to, in order order to, to go on the journey of recovery and be happy. You know, if we could be on the same page. I mean, you know, um, that's why we talk. You know, because we can't, nobody can relate to us. You know, we're a special breed of people. We're, we're very special and it takes a miracle for us to recover. So, I, you know, my, you know, we, we, we think, you know, we think we, we can get on the same page of thinking, our bodies, a physical allergy thing, and the spirit. Um, Mine is Father God. I call him my daddy. Okay. Somebody else might call him the doorknob or whatever, you know, but mine is my daddy. He's my dad. And I depend on him all the time. So that's what I mean by mind, body, and spirit. Must be no, you're, you're, absolutely, you're, you're absolutely right because our literature tells us that the mind and the body of an alcoholic is very sick. But it reminds us that when the spiritual malady is overcome. We straighten out mentally and physically. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. You know? So, yeah, there are, there's, there's three components to this thing. The mental, the physical, and the spiritual. And, yeah, it is great. We must have them all. We must work on all three. You know? We must work on all three. You want to pick up from there, Clive? We have no more questions or comments on what we're reading? No, uh, just that he's telling us here that we need an entire psychic change. That's a spiritual awakening. This is the first time it's referred. It's called a psychic change, and we're going to hear it again, and then again, an essential psychic change on this page. That's the solution. When the spiritual malady is overcome, that's this psychic change. We straighten out physically and mentally. It is a three-part disease we have, physical, mental, and spiritual. So we spiritual, we focus on that. That's the solution. And then the other stuff takes care of itself. So, okay, we'll go ahead and keep reading here. So on the other hand, it says, as strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, once a psychic change has occurred, there it is, change. The very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems, he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol, the only effort necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules. So there it is, this, <laughs> wow. You want to comment, cousin? Yeah, that definitely tells us that uh, people often come in here and, and say there are no rules in AA. There are some rules. There's a few simple rules, and we're going and they're going to go and tell us what they are now. Yeah, and like it or not, there are rules. <laughs> that's that's like uh, uh, when, when we hear people say the the program is free. The program is not free. You must work for it. It says that you know a price had to be paid. You know, Bill lets us know. A price had to be paid, you know. So again, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, no matter. We're gonna come. We're gonna come oh. back to you. I want him to read this a little bit more because he's gonna yeah. get into the rule. Yeah, I don't want to miss it. We'll come back to you, Loretta. Okay. So it says, uh, "Men have cried out to me in sincere and despairing appeal, Doctor, I cannot go on like this." 
I have everything to live for. I must stop, but I cannot. You must help me. Here's a desperate alcoholic. That was me. Faced with this problem, if a doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. Although he gives all that is in him, it often is not enough. This is your typical psychiatric or medical doctor trying to help. Not enough. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. Here he is. We need a higher power. Though the aggregate of recoveries resulting from psychiatric effort is considerable, we physicians must admit we have made little impression upon the problem as a whole. Many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. So there you have it. A normal therapist, psychiatry, not going to do the trick for us. That's not going to produce the essential psychic change. The only way we're going to have that essential psychic change is with a higher power, something more than human power. Very clear. So should we keep reading or uh, Mama Bear has her hand up? What do you think, cousin? Yeah, come on then, Loretta. <laughs> uh, Loretta Mama Bear and um, psychic change is renewing, uh, to me, it's, it's renewing my mind. And it takes my higher power to help me renew my, change the way I think. Um, yeah, I, I felt exactly that. I cannot go on like this. I mean, th towards the tail end, after 30 years, I said, I cannot go on like this. I, I, I need help. And, um, and and that's where it is. But the psychic change for me is uh, the renewing of my mind, um, putting in good things. And, and, and But it takes, I mean, you can read all the literature you want, all, you know, for all this positive thinking. You know, and, and that's nice. That's helpful. However, for me being an alcoholic, I need more than that. I need a power greater than myself to really achieve where I want to go to. This renewing of my mind um, that affects my my livelihood. Because anyway, thank you very much for letting me share. Peace out. Thank you, Mama Bear. And we're going to read exactly what you just said in the next paragraph. And what happens when we don't have a higher power? and why we need one. And what it says is, I do not hold with those who believe that alcoholism is entirely a problem of mental control. I've had many men who had, for example, worked a period of months on some problem or business deal which was to be settled on a certain date favorably to them. They took a drink a day or so prior to that date and then, guess what? The phenomenon of craving at once became paramount to all other interests so that the important appointment was not met. And here's what's happening. These men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. This is beyond our control. We cannot it's too powerful for us. We need a higher power to keep that from happening to us. It's that simple. So um, higher power, only thing that's going to work for us. And here we are. And here's how serious this is. This is grave. Listen to this. There are many situations which arise out of the phenomenon of craving, which cause men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. This almost brings tears to my eyes. That's how. Thank God. Thank God that, we found AA or AA found us. Ain't that something? Yeah. Unbelievable. The phenomenon of craving which caused men to make the supreme sacrifice 
rather than continue to fight. We just couldn't find an answer. We'd rather die than to go on living the way that we were living. People kill themselves. Because the alcoholic torture is, it's devastating, man. It's devastating, you know? When, when we don't have a way out, we can't see a way out, you know? And that's how yeah. serious this thing can be. This is really hitting home with me. Wow. When I, uh, when I showed up at my first meeting, I was weeping uncontrollably. I was so desperate. I, I was just I, being absolutely dominated by alcohol and drugs, and I couldn't do a darn thing about it. And that's what happens. And uh, people, it takes people to a certain point where you know they realize that hey, there's no way out of this. I'm hopeless. I'd rather just be dead. I can't handle it anymore. That's how serious this is, and that's why we need a higher power. We can't do it on our own. When we keep trying on our own, this is what happens. We get sicker and sicker and more desperate and more desperate. But thank God he's there for us to save us. All we have to do is follow the directions in this book. It's beautiful. So I'll go ahead and read some more here for us. The classification of alcoholics seems most difficult and in much detail is outside the scope of this book. There are, of course, the psychopaths who are emotionally unstable. We are all familiar with this type. They are always going on the wagon for keeps. They are over remorseful and make many resolutions, but never a decision. There's the type of man who is unwilling to admit that he cannot take a drink. He plans various ways of drinking. He changes his brand or his environment. There's the type who always believes that after being entirely free from alcohol for a period of time, he can take a drink without danger. There's the manic depressive type who is perhaps the least understood by his friends and about whom a whole chapter could be written. Then there's- Okay. What's a psychopath? Word check. Psychopath. That's someone who just doesn't care about right versus wrong, about other right. people at all. Right. Completely. About yeah, no empathy, mm -hmm. no remorse. Mm -hmm. Just let's, let's get the definition so that we know. Okay. I'm gonna look it up. We usually only hear that word in movies about some serial killer, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, yeah, let's see what so, the reading is. Okay, so a psychopath is those with antisocial personality disorder, uh, amoral, not caring about right and wrong, behavior without empathy or remorse. Uh, they just don't care about right versus wrong, and they have no empathy, no remorse, completely uh, just doing whatever they want to whoever they want, whenever they want. Antisocial personality. And and that includes harming themselves, too, by the way. Mm hmm That includes harming themselves, you know? Yeah. So, okay. All right. Here we are. The other type, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of types of us. And then it says uh, there are types ent entirely normal in every respect, except in the effect alcohol has upon them. They are often able, intelligent, friendly people. So they gave us a bunch of different descriptions. When we read further on in the chapter, there is a solution. We're going to learn about the three types of alcoholics. I mean, uh, the three types of drinkers. But here's the important thing. The point that Dr. Selkworth is making is this. All these and many others have one symptom in common. So this is what we have in common. 
They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. That's one thing we all share. Whatever type of alcoholic or type of drinker you are, um, whatever type of alcoholic, your personality type you are, uh, we all have the phenomenon of craving. It says this phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. This is what makes us different from normal drinkers. It has never been by any treatment with which we are familiar permanently eradicated. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. That means we Don't can't- Don't take the first cup of drink. Yep. Don't take that first suck of drink. Yep. That's, the, uh, that's it. If we take one drink, we're going to develop the phenomenon of craving, and it we are doomed. That's the bottom line. Period. That doesn't happen to normal drinkers. It happens to us. It says we cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. That's why we avoid the first sucker drink. Okay. So... <clears throat> This immediately precipitates us into a seething cauldron of debate. Oh, here comes a debate. That means differing opinions here. Much has been written pro and con, but among physicians, the general opinion seems to be that most chronic alcoholics are doomed. And I see that, uh, that matches my experience. Just look around. There's a lot of, and we, but for the grace of God, there go us. We are so blessed, so fortunate that God's grace has been extended to us because there are a lot of people out there that were, are just as desperate and hopeless as we were before we found this solution, before God provided this solution for us. Can I get Let's a let Kerry yeah. come in before? That's, hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hell yeah. Let's let Kerry come in before we get to this great part. Yeah. What so is I see. Solution? Good morning, Kerry. Um, so there's three types of alcoholics, and then it clearly states that one is the hopeless type. And then I see another one, which is normal in every as, as uh, every respect except for the effect of alcohol that has um upon them and what's the third one okay so you got the psychopath right and then you have the type who is unwilling to admit that he cannot take a drink so he plans different ways of drinking he changes his plans in an environment and this type always believes that he's going to, that he can, listen, if he stops drinking for a while, he can, he can overcome this thing. Then you have the manic depression. So let's, let's, let's take it down. You got the psychopath, right? You have the one who is unwilling to admit that he cannot take a drink. You have the manic depressive type who is perhaps the least understood. And then you have those that are entirely normal in every respect, every respect except for when it comes to alcohol. And I um I run across more of those people um than anything else. They're entirely normal, except for when it comes to drugs and alcohol. They're, they're insane, you know? That's where they screw up. So it sounds like like number two and three are so similar. Well they're I, similar. Uh, yeah, I, I can help you out here, Carrie. Yeah, so the, and there's one more in there, the type who believes that after being free from an alcohol for a period, he can drink. So they, they list five different types there, uh, different personality types. What I was referring to, Carrie, is on page 20 in the big book, and it describes the three types of drinkers. This, what we just read, are the five personality types. Oh. And, and then on page 20, it gives oh, us the, well, three, yeah, yeah, yeah. the three types of drinkers. I, I apologize for confusing you. Okay. Yeah. 
So is everybody clear on that? These are just five different examples of personality types of alcoholics. And the one thing all five have in common is we cannot start drinking. We can't take that first sucker drink because we're going to develop the phenomenon of craving. I have a question. Does anyone see their type in there? I, I saw I saw something that I identified with. I used to always believe that if I could if I could just stay away from alcohol for a while, that that uh, I could go back to it. I was a reservation maker. I gotta admit that I always had a reservation, you know, that that I that I'd go back. I don't have any reservation today because of the psychic change. But for years, if I could get this far, if I could do that, if this would only happen, if if the sky just stayed blue, you know. I, I, I could get away with it, you know? So I see my type, the type that I used to be in as far as I could change. Loretta, come on in. Do you see your type in here? That's what we want in. And where is it? Yes, I what about do. You, Clyde? What type are you? What type are you too, Clyde? Yeah. Everyone, come in. If you see, do you identify, you see your type, let us know in the, in the letter right here. Go ahead, Loretta, what type are you? Two and three. Unwilling okay. to admit. And always mm -hmm. believe that. <laughs> I quit drinking for about two years. And it was okay. I was fine. And because uh, I was a housewife closet alcoholic. I didn't drink as much as I did. Anyway, so something tra tragic happened. And I said, well, one or two beers won't hurt. Lo and behold, 30 years later, here I am. So two and three, I because um, I did try changing brands change drinking wine or drinking beer you know and yeah i tried it been there done that thank you very much have a nice day okay, yeah. Love you guys. Well, well, anyone else anyone else? and you know you talk about that and i was i was i would admit that i was an alcoholic that didn't mean nothing to me but i still i still was ready to plan a way out you know back to the bottom you know at the end of the day clyde what type were you yeah, you I was just un unwilling to admit, completely unwilling. <laughs> yeah, no way. <laughs> and, you see, and I was willing to admit it. I was willing to admit, but still, you know, and that, that just goes to tell me that admitting that I'm an alcoholic don't mean shit. <laughs> it yeah. didn't mean anything, you know? Mm -hmm. I knew I was an alcoholic, but I was willing to, I was, I was willing to go back, you know, after a while. Yeah. I feel like an idiot, but so the first one is the psychopath who, obviously can't figure that out the second is that you won't admit and then the third one says that they're normal and after time they can probably drink again so where's that's the what we believe yeah fifth? that's me then yeah. there's the manic yeah, yeah. manic depressive the manic depressive who is then, the least understood yeah mm -hmm. and then normal in every respect except uh, what the effect alcohol has upon them. There's five of them there. Five persons. I, I run into those all the time. I think it's a lot, a lot of those in our, in our home group. You know, people who are, you know, yeah, they're alcoholics and, and, you know, they're normal in every respect except for when it comes to alcohol. I run across a lot of people like that. They got good jobs. They have wives. They have families. Everything goes for them until they take a drink. Until they take a drink. Come on in, Maggie. What do you think it is? I'm also two and three. I remember changing my liquor and uh, drinking a, a Canadian club and whiskey, which I didn't ever care for. But but I drank it, you know. I, I tried all kinds of different things, and and then I was I was uh, um, I could operate and work the business and uh, still drink at night. So I was, uh, whatever you call it, can't think of it right off hand. But anyway, <laughs> this is good information. This is good information about ourselves, I'm realizing. Isn't that something? This is good stuff to know about myself. Wow. Yeah. Anyone else before we continue? See, see the type in this uh, these paragraphs here. How about just the one that they don't want to be an alcoholic, but they know they are? <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, we're something else. We're something else. Yeah. 
but I'm glad that I, I was able to identify you yeah. and, and others were able to identify. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Clyde. This is good now. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, now that I've uh, thought about it some more, yeah, yeah, I, uh, my type is definitely normal in every respect, except when I start drinking, watch out. <laughs> that, that's me. Uh, so, okay, we're going to continue now. This is exciting. The top of page XXXI, Roman numeral 31. What is the solution? So here we go. Now we know he, with what's going on with us. Now we know what's up with us, uh, why we're alcoholics. This physical and mental thing, and we need a higher power. Here's the solution. It says, perhaps I can best answer this by relating one of my experiences. It says, about one year prior to this experience, a man was brought in to be treated for chronic alcoholism. He, this is, and I'll show you his picture. This is Hank P. It says, he had but partially recovered from a gastric hemorrhage and seemed to be a case of pathological mental deterioration. He had lost everything worthwhile in life and was only living, one might say, to drink. He frankly admitted and believed that for him there was no hope. This is Hank Parkhurst, Bill's partner, uh, writing the book, getting it published. It says, following the elimination of alcohol, there was found to be no permanent brain injury. It says he accepted the plan outlined in this book. So that's what's outlined in this book, a plan. One year later, he called to see me, and I experienced a very strange sensation. I knew the man by name and partly recognized his features, but there, all resemblance ended. From a trembling, despairing, nervous wreck had emerged a man brimming over with self-reliance and contentment. I talked with him for some time but was not able to bring myself to feel that I had known him before. To me, he was a stranger, and so he left me. A long time has passed with no return to alcohol. Yeah, stop right there, but Yeah, that yeah. was that was Hank, Hank Parkhurst, and I'm telling you something about um, Hank Parkhurst and Bill. They, they met in the detox. <laughs> they met in detox. They met in Towns Hospital. Remember that it that it tells us uh, early on. It says that uh, when it talks about Bill, it says his third time, you know, taking the treatment. So Bill was not a one-time wonder. He was not a one-time wonder, you know. Uh, he had been in and out of that hospital a few times. That's where he met Hank P, right? And <clears throat> he met Hank P there, and 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 I think that they were there together more than once, you know. And I've had that experience too. I come back to the detox six, seven months later, and I'm in the detox with a guy I was in the detox with six months ago. Isn't that something? You know? And so that's when when Bill had um had his um experience, had a visit from Ebby, and went to the detox for the last time. He went back. And who was sitting up in there when he went back to talk to someone? Hank P. <laughs> And he started to give Hank P the program of recovery. Hank P came out and they became they became running buddies in sobriety. They became running buddies in sobriety. And um and 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 uh and uh that's when Hank Hank uh helped us to write the book. You know? Yeah, he was Bill's right hand man. That's how that was their relationship. Their relationship was based on them showing up in freaking detox together time after time, you know. Bill had went out and found a way out, and somehow when he came back, Hank was back in the hospital again, and he had a solution, and he presented it to Hank, and that and that's when Hank went to um see Doctor Silkworth after being sober for some time, and and he saw that this thing worked that Bill had um shared with them. Yeah, mm -hmm. ain't that something? Yeah. So you want to go ahead and read? Oh, Maggie, you want to come in? Oh, hold on, Maggie. Come on in, Maggie. You're, you're muted, Maggie. Yeah, come on. You can unmute. 
keep forgetting that. I have Bill Dotson written up there instead of Hank. Bill Dotson. No, that's not that's that's not Bill Dotson. Bill, Bill Dotson was in Ohio. He was in Akron. That's the difference. Yeah, yeah okay. he wasn't under Doctor Um. He wasn't under Doctor Doctor Um. So forth. Okay. He was in he was in the Akron Hospital. He was in the Akron Hospital. This was Hank P. Right. He had been going in and out of detoxes with with Bill. And Bill went back to the detox and he's sitting back up in there. But they had been in there a few times together. That's where they met. They met in detox. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's I encouraging. Think that this is a good place to stop. I think that this is a good place to stop this week. Okay. Perfect. You know? Yeah. And, this is uh, a great place. All right. So we're going to stop on page 31, the Roman, Roman numerals, right? Yep. And, uh, this has certainly certainly been great. I'm glad that I um made it here, here today. And uh, that really went by fast. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was an hour and a half. Jesus. So, yeah. And it so. was great. It was great. So we'll pick up from from there. We'll pick up from there next week. Let me get this. Uh, uh I gotta get the uh script back up. Okay. They tell me what to say here. Here we go. Almost there. Just want to thank you guys. This was really helpful. Yeah, yeah we'll be doing here. this every. We'll be doing this every week. You know, coming and sitting, and and we're recording it. You know, so that uh, we don't have to miss it, and we can always go back. So. Thank you all for coming out and um, sitting and reading this book with us today. And we'll be back here next week at um, at two thirty. Same time, same bat channel. Same time, same bat channel. And um, the podcast will be available by Friday on Telegram. Check Telegram for updates. So this is how we uh, uh, end this uh, thing here. The big book, page 164. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize that we know only a little, but God is constantly disclosing more to you and us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answer will come if your own house is in order. But obviously, you cannot transmit what you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is a great fact for us. So abandon yourself to God as you understand him. Admit your faults to him and your fellow. Clear away the wreckage of your past and give freely what you have found. found. And join us and we shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit and we will surely meet some of you as we trudge the road to happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Thank you all for coming out. Let's uh, recite the Lord's Prayer together and we'll close this uh, podcast. Who woke us up this morning? Our oh, Father, Father, who art God in heaven, heaven be thy, name. Thy, thy kingdom God, come, thy will, thy will, be, will be done on earth, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And I just I thank you all so much. And I just want to say one thing for the record. I want this on the recording. We encourage the participants that come to our podcast to read and study ahead because we're looking also to you to bring some answers to us as we study this book together. So we want you to cheat on the test. We want you to read ahead, find out some facts and information and feel free to come in and share it with us. Is that a deal? Yes. Absolutely, okay, yes sir. Cool. Yeah, all right, that's what we'll do. Okay, thanks cousin. Thank you. Good night, y'all. Have a nice night.